Those are searching words, aren't they? They, uh, they help us take a look inside. Uh, and maybe outside to Jesus. Are we ready? Would we be ready if Jesus came tonight? With everything going on in the world as, as it is today, those thoughts are on our minds, aren't they? Uh, the good news is Jesus. Because if we trust Him, if we put our trust in Him as our Savior, and if we ask Him to take us as we are, forgive our sins, cleanse our hearts, change us, we can be ready tonight. We can be ready today. We can be ready right now. That's good news. That is the good news of Scripture. Because the fact is, uh, friends, brothers and sisters, Jesus did everything necessary in his life and death to make it possible for us to spend eternity with him. And it's good news that we can take him up on his offer. Uh, two weeks ago, we began studying the topic of worship in our church. And the reason we're doing this is because I have been under a conviction, a feeling for a long time, that we don't experience worship like we could when we come on Sabbath morning. I believe that God has so much more available for us in the worship experience than what we often experience. What do I mean by that? Well, it's easy, even if you've grown up in the church, to think of worship as listening to a sermon. And we hope it's good. We hope it'll keep our attention. We hope it'll be interesting. The kids hope that the pastor will tell a story or two. Is that what we mean by worship? We hope the music will be good. And thank you, men, for that for that uh, wonderful song and the work that went into it today. And if the music is wonderful, we feel like we worship. Someone was talking to me this week about going to Loma Linda every once in a while for meetings and worshiping in the Loma Linda University Church with their music and their excellent speaker, pastor speaker, uh, Pastor Randy Roberts. And they said when they go there, they really feel like they worship. Is that what worship is? It can certainly help us in our worship. So, in spending this time with you last week and, and today, I want to invite you to a deeper experience of worship. I want to invite you to make some choices and begin some practices that will help you when you leave on Sabbath morning know that you have, have worshipped God. Seventh-day Adventists should be interested in this topic because one of our special messages that we've been given to share with the world says that we are calling the world to worship Him who made the heavens and the earth. And as Advent is what we often do with that, is we say, oh yeah, we need to tell people about the Sabbath and about our Creator God, right? But what does it mean when it says, worship Him? Is it worshiping God to keep the seventh day Sabbath? Well, that's part of our worship. But is that what John is thinking of? Is that what God's thinking of here? Worship Him that made the heaven and the earth. We looked at the old English word for, for worship. Way worshiping is the way you pronounce that. It means to ascribe worth to someone or something. To, to recognize the worth that someone has and honor that 
and bring our, our respect and our honor to God because of that. And then we looked at the Greek word for worship, proskuneo. It means to, to kiss the ground or to kiss the hand of a royal personage, to, to bring honor and reverence to that person. And who do we, after all, come to worship on Sabbath morning? Last week, we, we said we, we often think of worship on Sabbath morning as us being the audience and the pastor or the musicians being the presenters, performers, worship leaders. But the reality in Scripture is that God is the audience. And we all are bringing him worship. Now, now is, this, is this speaking to your mind that maybe something's different, something needs to change about the way we think of worship and the way we worship? Worship means to see God for who he is and have a heart response to that if not a physical response to that. Last Sabbath, we looked at a number of passages in Scripture where God did something amazing for His people. Maybe for an individual or for a family or for His church. And in almost every case, what it says is it says they fell on the ground and worshipped God. Now, you might say, well, that, that's their culture. No, I think that is the natural response when we truly see God. Now, we may not fall on the ground and bow before God, but in our hearts, in our minds. Have you ever had the experience of, of God just doing something amazing for you? And in your heart, you just said, God, that was you. And, you, and in your heart, you just bowed before him in worship. Have you ever had God show up in your Bible study or your Bible reading as you were depending on the Holy Spirit to teach you as you were reading the Bible and, and all of a sudden something came through to your mind and your heart just bowed before God and you said, God, thank you. You, you have revealed yourself. You have shown yourself. Now friends, Here's the point that I'm trying to make. God's plan is that we have a life of worship, not a appointment for worship on Sabbath morning. God wants us to experience continual worship. How do we learn that in scriptures? In the book of Revelation, God parts the curtains, opens the gate of heaven, and let's us look in on what's going on 24-7 in heaven. And the holy beings gathered around God's throne are constantly worshiping, way of worshiping, <laughs> proskuneo, they bow down, they fall before his throne, they cast their crowns constantly. Why is that? You might be saying to yourself, well, I get bored with that. I mean, all the time. Here's the point. The heavenly beings around God's throne are constantly seeing God do amazing things. God is the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the leader of the universe. And as he's working in the universe, these beings are constantly seeing God at work. And God is inviting us to have the same experience with him. Are you, are you following me? Are you getting what I'm saying? God wants us to come to the place where we tune our hearts to heaven. So that when we get to heaven, we'll be at home. We'll be comfortable there. We'll be ready to praise God for who he is and what he's always doing. Wow. I just, I just feel, brothers and sisters, that we're way below our privileges 
as sons and daughters of God. And I want to invite you along with me to, to go on a journey of, of experiencing more what it means to worship God. <clears throat> All right. Worship. When, when you come on Sabbath morning, do you come to bring God what He deserves? Do you come to bring Him a gift of praise? Either the praise of your heart or maybe a praise of offering. I, I met a young lady at the University of Washington when I was a chaplain there years ago. She was from France, and she was an Adventist student attending the University of Washington. She didn't have any income at the time. She was there by the help of family and friends and a scholarship and what have you. She didn't have any income, and she told me one day as I met her on the campus, with tears running down her cheeks, this was part of a larger conversation, she said, Pastor, I feel so bad because I, do, I cannot bring any tithes and offerings to God because I don't have income. And I saw her tears and I thought, wow, do I feel that way when I can't bring my tithe and offering on Sabbath morning? And I thought, Miriam, her name was Miriam. Miriam had an experience of worship when it came to bringing her tithes and offerings to the Lord that I have not experienced yet in my life, and it, and it challenged me. So I want to challenge all of us to think more deep. I think of the wise men. We know the story. Christmas is not that far away. No. <laughs> you get that sense that this year is moving along so fast? Christmas is almost here. School started. Wow. The wise men. My wife and I have been in Israel, and we have a sense now of distances. They travel possibly for months on their camels, in their caravan. After they had studied the Hebrew Bible and discovered that the God of the universe was going to become flesh and live among us. And then they saw that, that prophecy in Genesis that says, we have seen a star arise out of Jacob. And they began to look. They were, they were astronomers as, as well as other things. They began to look and they saw a new star. And they said, that's it. We've got to follow it. And so they, but they said, we're going, we're going to see the king, the king of Israel, the king of the universe. We have got to take gifts. And so they bought expensive gifts. Gold and myrrh and incense. And they brought it. All that way, night after night, looking at the stars, recounting the prophecies, thinking of the God become man, preparing their hearts for worship. And they came and they bowed before the Christ child. Scripture, the prophets in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, often challenged God's people when they saw that they had slipped into religious formalism just kind of coming and going to worship out of habit, out of duty, like a, like a door kind of swings on its hinges, you know, well, time to go to church, time to go home, time to go to church, time to go home. When God's people got to that place, the prophets spoke up because God wants us to have a hard experience with Him. And so, so this is what Isaiah wrote. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing 
meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. Now, why did God say this? Obviously, if you read Isaiah chapter 1, it's because his people were had fallen into a very bad place and they become very sinful. There was a lot of injustice that was going on in the country. A lot of bloodshed, a lot of uh, thievery and so forth. Kind of like in some places in the United States right now. But, but earlier in Isaiah 1, he puts his finger on the heart of the problem. And here it is. He says in verse 3, The ox knows his master. The donkey, his owner's manger, but Israel does not know me. My people do not understand me. God's great heart is crying out for a relationship with his children, with us. He wants to be known. He wants to be loved. Um, and, and he said, look, even the animals... You know, I, I look at uh, Kritu's new little puppy dog that they have. And it's so fun to see him and, and see the kids playing with him. That little dog knows who his family is. He knows he's a Kritu. <laughs> and he follows the Kritus around. And it says here, the ox knows his master. The donkey knows his owner's manger. But Israel does not know me. And so God is inviting us here to ask ourselves, Friends, do we know God in a personal way? Do we know Him? Jesus said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, empty. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You know, it's easy in growing up in, in a Christian church to kind of live by traditions and by habits and by rules and not have that personal relationship that God longs for and that we need so much. And this is what Jesus was, was talking about. It's, it's what he was saying to the Jewish people. He's saying Isaiah was right. The Jewish people at, at, in the time of Jesus were very religious. They were very religious. They had their festivals, their yearly sacrifices, all, all kinds of They had those. But for, for them, it had come to the place where it was just a ritual. It wasn't a personal experience. And so that's what we need. The question this morning is, our worship truly heart worship? Are we responding to our God who loves us, who is worthy of our praise, someone that we have a relationship with? Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who you said. How do you get to know someone? You spend time with them, don't you? You, you have conversation with them. That's why God's given us his, his word and he's given us prayer so that we can have conversation with him on a regular basis, a daily basis. What difference does it make whether we worship God as a form or worship God from our heart? I want to give you three reasons, okay? Number one, God, what difference, so the question is, what difference does it make? Whether worship is just a ritual that we go through it, we get some benefit out of it, right? Some benefit. Or it's a relationship, it's an experience from our heart. Number one, like parents of any age, older parents, younger parents, Long for recognition from their children. Long to be known and loved. How is it, you young parents, when, you're, when your child first recognized you and broke out into a smile? How was that? Did your heart just, you know, just kind of explode inside of you? 
smiled at me. It might have been a gas bubble. <laughs> she smiled at me. She knows me. And this goes all through life. He or she, the parents, long for appreciation, long for acknowledgement. God is the same way. Because our, he's our heavenly parent. He created us. He has supported us and helped the human race. He's tried to save us from ourselves and our sins for millennia. And Jesus came here to reveal himself and help us know him better. God longs for our worship. He longs for our acknowledgement. He longs for our appreciation. Debbie and I are parents of young adult children now. We can be parents to some of the young adults. And we get together with our young adult children sometimes. And we listen to their adventures and their stories and everything that's happening in their lives professionally and with their children. And sometimes my wife and I, don't listen kids if you're watching this, Sometimes my wife and I just think to ourselves, we wish they would ask a little more about us. How are you doing? How is your life? Can, can some of you older parents relate to that? You know, how are you feeling? Uh, how's your work going? As parents, we long for that. God longs for us to include him in our life as part of our daily conversation. Now you say, well, you're kind of making God too much like us. Hello, who did God create us like? In his own image. That means we're like him. He's given us the capacity to know, to love, and all of those things. Number two, I need to hurry along. When we worship God as he deserves, there's a communication between his heart and ours. It's a relationship. And that's why he complains in the Laodicean message, I wish so much that you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. I wish you were hot. Now, why does he say cold? Because sometimes when people are cold spiritually, they recognize their need and they turn to God and he changes things and then they become hot. But what God really wants is hot. In our house, we have one shower that's never really hot. It's on a solar system. And on cooler days, I don't, I don't shower in that place. <laughs> uh, Lukewarm water, cold water. No. Have you ever picked up your, your, your mug and you thought it was a hot drink and you started to take a drink and it was lukewarm? Not good. Not good. God wants us to be hot. Now, point number three. Does it make a difference whether we are worshiping God with our heart? Point number three. If you are coming hoping to hear a sermon that will bless you, music that will inspire you, fellowship that will encourage you, food that will taste good and nourish you. You are just getting the minimal blessings that God wants for you on Sabbath morning. Did you hear me? You're just going for the minimum. You might be getting a little blessing, but God wants you to have extravagant Blessings. How? I want to close today by telling you how. We learned last week that we really worship God with the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. This is saying that the Holy Spirit is involved in our prayer life. 
He's also involved in our worship life. The Holy Spirit impresses, inspires worship as we open our hearts to God and ask Him to do it. Jesus said this, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Seventh-day Adventists are good about emphasizing the latter part, right? Truth. We don't want to let go of truth. We don't want to lose the truth. We want to compromise the truth. But God is saying we worship in spirit and truth. We worship spiritually. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And then Paul actually says it straight out. We, for it is we who worship by the spirit of God who glory in Christ Jesus. Paul is describing a kind of worship that is more than human. The Holy Spirit who comes to live within us when we accept Jesus enables our worship. So I want to give you 10 suggestions. This is not exhaustive. And I'm going to do them quickly. That will help enhance your worship. Number one, practice worship in your devotional life. Read, meditate, pray, yes. But worship. Look for things you can worship God about. Tell Him what you see about Him and how you look at Him in your devotional life. In your devotional life, tell God how much you love Him. Is Walden in the house? Don't leave me now, Walden. <laughs> Something just snapped and, and it all went funny. Thank you. Practice worship in your devotions. Number two, if you went to Pathfinders, uh, one of the Pathfinder pledges was carry a song in your heart. Do you sing through the week? Do you sing as you go through your day? Well, you say, I don't have a good voice. It doesn't matter. If you're alone, I do it all the time. You can sing. Let those songs from childhood, from you, just well up in praise to God. The birds do it in the morning. My, my daughter would say, well, they're marking their territory and they're, you know, she's a biologist. I think they're praising God as well. Number three, spend time meditating on the cross often. There's nothing like Jesus, death on the cross, to lead you to worship him. Number four, plan how you will worship God when you come to church on Sabbath. Plan, plan it through the week. Make a list of things you want to thank God for when you get to church. If you have children, make, uh, get them involved in this. Um, during, during the week, ask your kids, kids, look for God this week. Find God sightings this week. God sightings. I think that's a good idea. I didn't come up with it. God sightings. Encourage your kids to see God during the week and then come and thank Him. Bring your tithes and offerings as an act of worship when you come. Number five, when you come to church, when you come to church, my dad taught me this. He said, Michael, when you go into the sanctuary, sit down and bow your head and pray and ask God to be with you as you worship Him. Have you ever done that? I'd like to recommend that. In some churches, they kneel when they come in. I'm not saying you have to kneel, but you can, you can kneel in your heart. You can, you can say, God, I'm here to worship you. Help me worship you as you deserve. Number six, this is really important. You know, we often come to church with a, with a busy heart, with a heart that is, you know, just kind of overworked from the week. Sometimes we come with a hard heart. Sometimes we come with a fearful heart. I believe that we can come into the church and we can give our hearts to God. And we can say, God, 
help me to really see you and hear you and know you and worship you today. Oh, number seven, picture God on his throne. We gather to worship the king. Number eight, see all of church as worship from beginning to end. You know, some people call the first part of church the preliminaries. The preliminaries. Have you ever heard that? I've heard, well, maybe pastors. The preliminaries. You know the opening prayer, the opening song. And then the real worship happens, and that's when the pastor gets up to preach. Now, let's, let's get rid of that idea. All of church is worship. We worship God when we sing the opening song. We're opening our hearts to Him. We're praising Him on His throne as we sing. When we kneel and we listen to someone pray, we can join them in prayer. We can make their prayer our prayer too. We can say yes. You don't have to say it out loud, especially those of you who come from a culture where it's, worship is very quiet, very solemn. That's okay. Those of you who come from a culture where it's okay to say amen, yes, please do, please do. I'm gonna preach about that sometime. We need each other culturally. I don't like it when we just kind of get off in our own churches, you know, the, the Samoans over here. We miss out so much. I'm glad that there are a few Samoans here today. I saw Keith. Are you here, Keith? Maybe not. Maybe I'd take the little one out. We need the Samoans. We Asians need the Samoans to help us be a little more, you know, expressive in our worship. My wife and I were wa watching some African worship last night because she's been in Africa as, as a missionary with her husband, short term. I won't do it. <laughs> the Africans cannot worship without their bodies. They march, they move. You know, you, you got it, Al. And so scripture teaches us to worship God with our whole being. When we went to Israel and we were at the Wailing Wall, as they're worshiping, they're, they're with their scriptures and they're worshiping with their whole being. I'm not suggesting we have to do that here. I'm just trying to expand. Number nine, you know, and I heard, um, Levon, what you said this morning, in Asian culture, it's more corporate. And that becomes unhealthy sometimes. That's the point. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, but I, I will tell you on the mainland, worship is very individualistic. Western culture is individualistic. It's what I do. But I think scripture invites us to worship corporately. We Westerners are terribly individualistic, but friends, we're one body. And when we come together, there's a sense in which we are all bringing our worship to God together. And it's a wonderful thing to look around you and say, that's my brother, my sister. This is, this is my, we're the body of Christ and we're worshiping him today. And number 10, I already mentioned it. We need to worship God with the help of the Holy Spirit. If you look into your own heart, as I've been preaching this morning about this topic, and you look into your own heart and you say, wow, I don't have that in me. Well, hello, I don't have it either. But when I bring my poor, uh, weak heart to God, and I give it to Him, and I say, Lord, help me to know you, to love you, to worship you as you deserve, you know what? He loves that, and He does. He does. And He comes in, and He helps us. And so, my dear friends, the things that I've suggested today I brought them to you to enhance your worship, to make it extravagant, not just going for the minimum, but really experiencing God in His fullness on Sabbath morning. Uh, Daniel Stratus has talked to us about praise, and this fits in. We need to praise God for all He deserves on Sabbath morning. All right, we're going to sing a closing song today. It's a quiet song about the Holy Spirit. And I put it here in the service because we need the help of the Holy Spirit. That's what this song says. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. Prayer.